Hello, uh, my name is Sajan Radinovich. Uh, I am a PhD student at the University of Oslo, where I work on cosmic voids, uh, or as my mom likes to say, I study nothing, uh, which is kind of true. I've been attending cosmology from home from a couple, for a couple of years now without actually attributing with a talk, so it's really nice to actually uh, contribute, and I look forward to all of the discussions later. So, um, as the title suggests, I will be talking about the void galaxy cross correlation function uh, and what can it tell us about the universe, and in particular, uh, what co cosmological constraints we can expect from voids in Euclid. Uh, so, first question uh, what exactly are voids? Uh, it's an intuitively easy thing to answer. Uh, voids are simply underdense regions in the large scale structure. So we can look at this picture, which is uh, galaxies in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and we can identify the clusters and the filaments, and we can point to the underdense regions between them and say that might be a void, and also these, and certainly that has to be a void. But then what if I take away the galaxies? Where are the voids now? Uh, this kind of illustrates nicely that voids are really defined by their surroundings, and we need some sort of a tracer to um, identify where the voids are. Different void finding algorithms uh, go about this in different ways. Uh, here, there's uh, several commonly used void finding algorithms that um, all technically approach the task in a different way and find different underdense objects. And these objects have different uh, properties and they're beneficial in different situations. If you want to check out any of these, uh, you can find them at the QR codes that are provided. The specific void finder that I use uh, is this watershed void finder called Voxel. It puts all of the, all of the tracers on a grid and then smooths the field to estimate the density. And then it picks the lowest density point and starts filling the field with water uh, like a lake. So to not get too technical and run with this uh, lake analogy, the center of the, the deepest point would be the center of the lake or the void, and then the shore would be the edge. But just with lakes, voids come in many different uh, shapes, sizes, they're differently oriented in the sky. And not only that, uh, since they are under dense regions, they have very few galaxies in and around them, which makes it very difficult to actually measure any sort of property. Um, what we can do instead is stack the voids on top of each other. And if we stack enough voids together, we will get something that has a lot more galaxies so that we can actually measure some properties like the density profile of a void, um, which is shown in the plot here. If we look at the center, we see that it's, uh, the over density is negative, which means that we're really looking at an under dense object and it tapers off to zero. Uh, meaning it's uh, tapering off to the background density of the universe. Of course, because this is an underdense object, we can assume that uh, galaxies will be flowing away from the center of the void. And this uh, radial velocity um, away from the center is another thing that we could measure. It looks like this. So the velocity is positive, meaning that it really, the, the galaxies really are going away from the center. Uh, towards more dense areas. Another consequence of our stacking is that the if the universe is isotropic and the void orientations are random in the sky, the stacked void will be spherically symmetric. Um, of course, in reality, in observations, the spherical sym symmetry will actually be broken by two observational effects, which are uh, redshift space distortions, or RSD, and the alcock pachinsky effect, or AP. Uh, redshift space distortions are uh, the result of proper motions of galaxies, uh, like the outflow that I mentioned before. So this proper motion interferes with our estimate of redshift and distorts the galaxy field and with it the void. 
Uh, and this deformation happens, uh, of course, along the line of sight. On the other hand, uh, the AP effect uh, arises from the fact that in observation, we measure redshifts and angles in the sky. And to actually convert these to physical distances, we need to assume a fiducial cosmology. We don't know if this is same as the true cosmology of the universe. Probably it is not. And if we are wrong, we will end up with wrong distances. This also distorts uh, the galaxy positions and therefore the shape of the void. This, however, is not a bug. It is a feature because if we can model these two, and we think we can, assuming that voids should be spherically symmetric in the ground truth, we can use these effects to constrain the growth of structure as well as the nature of dark energy. This brings us to the second part, the void galaxy cross correlation function, which helps us do this. Uh, in very simple terms, the cross correlation function shows us distributions of galaxies around voids. So for a distance r between a void and galaxy pair, and the angle between this vector and the line of sight, which is parameterized by mu, we can construct the cross correlation function as a function of r and mu, and this is shown in the plot here. For mu equal to one, we are looking along the line of sight, and for mu zero, perpendicular to the line of sight. This specific plot is in redshift space, which means it has the redshift space distortions. So the cross correlation function for these two values of mu is different. An easier way to see this is decomposing this cross correlation function into multipoles. Um, this gives, a, gives us a monopole, which shows the average galaxy density around voids basically, and a quadrupole, which shows deviations from a spherical shape. So if this was in real space, that quadrupole would be consistent with zero, but since it is not, it has a very distinct shape. We can model the mapping between these two quantities, the redshift space and real space, by simply convolving the real space cross correlation function with some distribution of line of sight galaxy velocities. Uh, these velocities are, of course, what makes the RSD. So we assume that this distribution is a Gaussian centered on the radial outflow velocity, which is, again, the plot that I showed before, and it has some dispersion sigma v. The AP effect is then accounted for by rescaling distances. So R for the real space distances and S for the redshift space ones uh, with these Alcock-Puchinsky parameters, alpha parallel and alpha perpendicular, which are themselves ratios of the uh, co-moving angular diameter distance and the Hubble distance in uh, the true cosmology and the fiducial cosmology. So they are a measure of how wrong we are with our assumption in the fiducial cosmology. What we actually constrain is this epsilon parameter, which is the ratio of alpha perpendicular to alpha parallel. Um, if we can constrain epsilon through uh, this relation, we can constrain the nature of dark energy. Now, back to the RSD mapping. We, of course, don't know the galaxy velocities from observations, sadly. Uh, instead, we can use templates that we measure in simulations and which have been shown to have a simple scaling. So for example, we leave the amplitude of the velocity dispersion free, uh, marginalizing over it after running our likelihood estimation. Uh, the radial velocity instead um, scales uh, with the growth rate parametrized by F sigma eight. Now, the caveat here is that there is an implicit assumption um, that the velocities are related to the underlying matter field delta with this linear continuity equation. Um, more uh, details into this or and whether or not it's a good assumption, you can read, for example, in Elena Masera's uh, work cited here. So we have the velocities, but what about the real space cross correlation function in yellow, which is also part of our theory? 
uh, our observations are in redshift space, so we don't know what real space looks like. Um, there's a couple of way, ways to handle this. I will focus on what we specifically did in this work, um, the work that I will show in a bit, which is the use of a reconstruction technique. Reconstruction is a technique which takes a galaxy field in redshift space and based on it estimates the peculiar velocity field uh, of those galaxies. Uh, if we know this velocity, we know, we know how to shift the galaxies back to real space. Uh, for BAO people, yes, this is the same reconstruction technique that you use. We just ignore the nonlinear part because we only care about removing RSD. We don't care about nonlinear evolution. Um, anyway, now that we have these approximate real space uh, galaxy positions, we can use them to actually find voids. This is an added benefit of using reconstruction because finding the voids in redshift space catalog can, re can uh, lead to a biased sample. So to recap our pipeline, we take an observed redshift space catalog and run reconstruction to get approximate real space positions. We then run void finding on this real space catalog and correlate these voids both with real space and redshift space galaxies to obtain the real space and redshift space cross correlation function uh, respectively. And then we can run our MCMC chains. So the final part of this talk uh, concerns the Euclid forecast that we got using this pipeline. Uh, Euclid, as many of you probably know, is the galaxy survey that is said to observe tens of millions of galaxies over almost a third of the sky. Uh, depending on when you see this talk and how things go, hopefully it's already on its way to L2, finally silencing all of the when will Euclid launch jokes. We used the flagship simulation constructed specifically for use by the Euclid Consortium, uh, divided it into four redshift bins, uh, and then estimated the constraints we expect from Euclid in an idealized scenario, which is used as a baseline, uh, and two more realistic cases. First, checking how our reconstruction method uh, influences results, and then introducing an additional error in redshift determination and seeing how much that messes things up. Uh, for the ideal case, we used actual real space positions of galaxies, which are available for the simulation. Um, so we are skipping the reconstruction part of the pipeline. Uh, using a numerical covariance matrix, we performed a fit to obtain the marginalized 1D constraints seen here in blue. Uh, on top is a constraint on the ratio of the co-moving angular diameter distance to the Hubble distance, which comes from the AP effect. And on the bottom is a constraint on the growth rate, which comes from the RSD. As you can see, we managed to recover the fiducial parameters with a precision which is mostly consistent across the redshift range. Um, to see how reconstruction influences these results, uh, we take the observed galaxy positions instead, run reconstruction like I described in the pipeline, and we get the results in light red, which are in agreement with the ideal case to within one sigma, and uh, they don't. Uh, the constraints are not degraded, which is very good. Finally, we add in a Gaussian error at the very beginning to the observed redshifts and then run the whole pipeline with the reconstruction uh, again, uh, obtaining the constraints in dark red, uh, which are again in uh, agreement with the other two cases, meaning that the redshift errors added are also not significantly affecting our results. We then rescaled our covariance matrix up to the full Euclid volume because the flagship volume is smaller than the expected full Euclid one. Um, and we constructed a synthetic data vector so that we could obtain an actual forecast for Euclid. So here I show the expected constraints on the same two parameters as before, and I include the current constraints from SDSS voids at lower redshifts um, as a comparison. Uh, the shaded bands uh, here and also on the previous plot uh, represent uh, Planck constraints extrapolated to the red redshifts given. 
Uh, so I think this plot really shows the benefit of higher redshift surveys like Euclid. Uh, in particular, if we just take the AP constraints on top and translate them into constraints on dark energy. So taking, for example, a simple extension to Lambda CDM, a model like Omega CDM, uh, which leaves free the, the dark energy equation of state, we get um, these constraints. The yellow uh, constraint is now, again, from SDSS, but not voids. Instead, the BAO plus full shape analysis compared to just Euclid voids. Um, this really illustrates the value of not only Euclid, but also voids as a promising new probe in cosmology. Um, so thank you for your time. And I look forward to hearing any questions that you might have in the session.